Well, I'm going to get started. Thank you all for being here today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Buck, and I'm running for the 171st Legislative District, serving parts of Center and Mifflin counties. I'm grateful for you uh, coming tonight to learn about climate change, its impacts on Pennsylvania, and what we can do about it together. And I'm so grateful to Dr. Michael Mann and Brandy Robinson for joining us. This is the third in a regular series of panels and meetups so that we can learn about the issues, hear from our neighbors, and decide what needs to be done to make sure that people in the communities of central Pennsylvania are getting a fair shake at a bright future. Two weeks ago, I hosted technology leader Sasha Meinrath and Decatur Township Supervisor Rich Foltz to talk about rural broadband. And prior to that, I hosted two epidemiologists from the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics to learn about the novel coronavirus, how it's spreading, and what we can do to take care of ourselves. You can watch those on my campaign's YouTube channel, and please do your parts to stay safe and connected so that we can come out on the other side stronger and healthier. So even as COVID-19 has turned our lives upside down, we need to keep our eyes on the change in climate. State and national reports have shown that the climate crisis has cost Pennsylvania hundreds of millions of dollars in property damage from flooding, lost profits in agriculture, recreation and tourism, and health impacts from increased heat stress, asthma, and new diseases. With the virus making work and life much more difficult, we have to be vigilant and make sure people understand why the climate is changing and what we can do about it. So tonight we're gonna to discuss the science, the impacts, and what is happening at the local level to take action, and what we as individuals can do about it. Because ultimately, this is about us working together. My panelists tonight are experts in the science and action on climate change. Dr. Michael E. Mann is Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at Penn State and Director of the Earth System Science Center. He is one of the world's leading researchers on Earth's climate, the author or co-author of four books on climate change. He recently returned from Australia, which we will talk about, where he spoke with the public regularly as the 2019-2020 wildfires unfolded. Brandy Robinson is the chair of the Ferguson Township Climate Action Committee and the chair of the Center Region's Technical Advisory Group for Climate Action and Adaptation Planning. She also teaches in geography, energy and sustainability policy, and the Renewable Energy and Sustainable Systems programs at Penn State. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. So, Mike, I want to start with you. Um, really basic, but really big. What is climate change, and how is it affecting Pennsylvania? Yeah, so, um, you know, climate change, the basics uh, aren't that complicated. When you put carbon pollution into the atmosphere, it warms up the atmosphere, it warms the surface of the planet. Uh, the science, the basic science goes back nearly two centuries. So we've literally understood for nearly two centuries that there's this relationship between these so-called greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide that are produced from the burning of fossil fuels and some other uh, human activities, and the climate uh, that we experience on this planet. Now, temperature, surface temperature uh, warming is one aspect of climate change. And so when you hear people talk about global warming, um, global warming and climate change are, are really synonymous, but global warming is just one attribute mm. of how the climate changes as we add carbon pollution to the atmosphere. We warm up the planet, we warm the surface in the lower atmosphere, but we also shift wind patterns and ocean currents, uh, drought regions, uh, regions uh, of uh, rainfall. Um, we, we literally shift uh, those regions spatially and uh, temporally. So you see changes in the, the timing of the seasons, changes in rainfall patterns, changes in drought patterns, and increases in extreme weather events. And you already alluded to the, the impact that climate change is having uh, on Pennsylvania and the rest of the world. And of course, in Australia, uh, as you alluded to, where I spent uh, my sabbatical in, uh, earlier in this year, um, we actually uh, witnessed the impacts of climate change playing out in real time in, in a profound way. So the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. We're seeing them play out 
on a regular basis in the form of extreme weather events like bushfires, drought, heat waves, flooding events, super storms, the increased frequency and severity of these extreme weather events is playing out around the world and it's certainly impacted us here in Pennsylvania. Uh, the damage done by flooding, uh, I remember um, just uh, uh, two summers ago, um, the, the schools uh, almost had to be closed down and, and couldn't open on time because of the huge mildew buildup. And that mildew buildup was due to a record wet summer here in Pennsylvania. And that record wet summer in Pennsylvania was related to a larger scale pattern in how the jet stream is changing. And some of my own research has investigated how the warming of the planet is impacting the jet stream. So you get more of these sort of extreme weather events. You get the jet stream that gets stuck in a particular uh, pattern where you have, for example, a low pressure region that just sits over Pennsylvania for most of the summer. Um, that's when you get record rainfall. Meanwhile, because this is part of some long-term wave pattern in the atmosphere, you have a high pressure area, a ridge downstream over California. And so as California in the summer of 2016 was experiencing unprecedented heat and drought and wildfires, we were experiencing unprecedented rainfall. And each of those events, of course, was devastating. Um, whether you lost your home um, and there were lost lives in those uh, unprecedented wildfires or the severe economic toll of the extreme rainfall that we saw here in Pennsylvania that summer. Uh, once again, the impacts aren't subtle. Hmm. Right, so climate change is here. It's not some distant thing in the future and it impacts our, our homes. And, and I wanna look to you, Brandy, because you've been very, very engaged right here at the, at the local level. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering how you can take what Mike just said and frame it in terms of what's happening in, at the local level. Sure, so in terms of what's happening at the local level, do you want me to focus more on impacts or the actions we're taking to try to address the impacts? Well, I think Mike just gave in, us an idea yeah. of what some of those impacts are. And so, yeah, how are those impacts being addressed? Well, so, so what's been interesting to see happen with action to address climate change is that it is inherently a geographic exploration because what we see is that right now, we don't currently have enough or really any action at the federal level to address climate change. And so in response to that, what we're seeing is that states, municipal governments, private businesses are sort of banding together and saying, we still prioritize this and we recognize that climate change and its impacts pose a real threat to our livelihood and the things we care about. So we're going to move forward with addressing it. And so right here in central PA, we can see that because several of our local municipalities have adopted resolutions to take swift and aggressive action toward climate change. So in other words, we're not waiting around for the federal government to, to provide us with a response. We're crafting our own. And in a lot of ways, this makes sense because while climate change is a global problem, the effects we experience from it are highly localized. And so by working on these plans to address climate change at the local level, we're able to sort of tailor them to the specific needs and um, sort of preferences of our communities. So for example, in Ferguson Township, um, where I live and where I've done a lot of this work, uh, a couple of years ago, the, the board passed a resolution with the, the goal of achieving carbon neutrality for the township by 2050 or sooner if possible. And you know, 2050 sounds kind of far away, but, but it's really not anymore, especially when you're thinking about trying to turn the cogs of, the, of these big infrastructural changes that might be necessary to, to put change in place. So when that resolution was passed, that, um, that triggered our, our, our uh, committee to be formed. So we have a volunteer committee that I chair of um, local residents with an interest and most people have a pretty awesome expertise in, in climate change and what we can do to solve it. So the first thing that, that we needed to do and really 
any entity looking to address climate change needs to do is figure out what your baseline is, right? Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't affect change on something that you don't have quantified. And so the first thing that we did was we took a pretty comprehensive inventory of the emissions coming from our township. You know, if so, we're going, if we're going to say we want to be carbon neutral, what does that mean? How far do we have to go? So before we get too far, you, you've brought up a concept that I, a number of people may under, have uh, some understanding of, but you're talking about something called carbon neutrality. And earlier, Mike said, you know, was talking about carbon emissions and... So carbon dioxide, right, is the, the, the largest um, uh, component of the uh, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that's driving the changes. But, and there are others like methane, and we're not going to get into all of them. So there are greenhouse gases that are heating the atmosphere, as you said. And then you're saying something, carbon neutrality. So what do you mean by that, and why is it important? So for our purposes here, what we're trying to do is, is um, quantify the amount of those gases that are going into the atmosphere because of our activities, what huh. we refer to as anthropogenic emissions. So this is an, it, so this, in a way, this is an act of just sheer responsibility. What am I accountable for? Right. So hmm. I drive my car to work. There's an emissions consequence to that. I use electricity in my home that has a consequence. So we're trying to look at, at all of those sort of activities just, just for you know, everyday life in our, in our homes and businesses and, and what footprint that has on, mm. on the environment and on the atmosphere. Um, so that's what we're trying to look at is, well, how much of the emissions that are, are there mm -hmm. are because of us? Okay, so I think I'm going to want to get into some of those numbers, maybe in a little bit, just so that people can see the kind of work that can be done at the local level that's very positive and can work with higher levels of government like the state government, right? Sure. But before that, there's this interesting thing, because you're, you're saying, okay, I drive my car, and that has emissions, and I flick the light switch, and in Pennsylvania, the majority of the emissions in our power sector come from natural gas and coal, right? There's a substantial nuclear presence, yeah. and then there's a, very, a growing wind and solar, but it's, it's a smidge, right? So that you're talking about, well, I do this individual thing, and I do this individual thing, but if we only do individual things, right, if we only think that way, then it keeps us from acting. And I know, Mike, you wrote a piece that was in USA Today with uh, John Brocka. Yeah. Right. And so can you talk about this thing about like individual action is important, but maybe collective action is more important. Yeah. More as are, important. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, both are uh, obviously important. Um, there are things that we can do in our everyday lives that we ought to be doing that decrease our environmental footprint in general um, and our carbon footprint. And in many cases, they make us healthier. They save us money. We feel better about ourselves. Why, why wouldn't we do these things? And we set a good example for others to follow as well. Uh, the point that we made in, in that piece and, and a more general point that I've tried to make uh, in my efforts to inform this discussion is that you need incentives in place um, that guide people in the right direction, right? Because mm. we won't all um, engage in carbon friendly uh, action simply because we know it's the right thing to do. Um, in many cases, we need incentives, um, and those can be market incentives. If it's cheaper to get your uh, energy or electricity from fossil, uh, from uh, you know renewable energy than it is from fossil fuels, then you're going to elect to get your energy from renewable uh, renewable sources, whether or not you're actively thinking about the impact that that will have on the environment and the planet. And so, what we need are market incentives. Um, that will uh, basically level the playing field, right? Uh, because right now we have fossil fuel energy, and when we burn carbon, we burn fossil fuels, we're doing real damage to the planet, and it's having a cost that all of us bear, but there's no price signal for that cost in, in the economy. Um, it's what we call an externality. You can dump your carbon waste into the atmosphere if you're a coal-fired power plant uh, uh, or um, you're burning fossil fuels, uh, and there's no cost for doing that, uh, even though you're dumping your pollution into the atmosphere. And so the idea is we need to level the playing field. 
Uh, and we can do that by putting a price on carbon. We can do that by providing explicit uh, uh, incentives, subsidies for renewable energy. There are lots of ways to do that. And there's an interesting conversation to have, for example, about how we can do that in a way that's uh, just. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about climate justice and a just transition. We don't want to price carbon in a way that hurts those people who have the least resources and are most impacted, uh, frontline communities. So we need to think about how we can do that in a just manner. And there are interesting ideas on the table for how you can design a, a price on carbon that is in fact a not regressive, but is progressive, um, where you know people in the lower strata of our economy um, actually uh, get, uh, get money back, uh, money in their pockets. Um, there are ways to, to structure that revenue that comes in, for example, uh, when you put a price on carbon in a way that's just, in, in a way that's progressive. Um, and that's where the conversation should be. And, you know, and in what can we do to help incentivize renewable energy? Um, because there's this unfair competition where right now, we've actually got a federal government that is providing all sorts of subsidies implicit as well as explicit um, for fossil fuels, and they're not providing those subsidies. So in fact, the playing field isn't level. We're actually providing incentives to those sources of energy that are hurting us and hurting uh, the planet and hurting our environment. Um, so we need to level the playing field. We need policies in place that will guide people in the right direction. There's a lot of talk these days about uh, the Green New Deal and there are uh, some really interesting attributes of the Green New Deal and there are different versions of it that are out there. Um, I think um, some form of that uh, makes a whole lot of sense. One thing that's actually missing in some versions of the Green New Deal is carbon pricing. And I would like to see that in there as well. And so let, let's have that conversation, but, but let's not continue to have this fake debate about, you know, uh, which we have right now among congressional Republicans and a president who literally denies that climate change um, is real. He's dismissed climate change as a hoax, just as he dismissed, of course, coronavirus as a hoax. Um, yeah. You know, we, we need to get a, a beyond that. We need to have a serious conversation. We need adults in the room having that conversation. Well, it's, it is it is very interesting. So, uh, you know, I think Pennsylvania has a unique role um, as well in in the United States and in the world. And, you know, some people probably aren't aware that Pennsylvania is responsible for nearly 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. There are seven and a half billion people in the world and 12 and a half million of them live in Pennsylvania. And yet, you know, you can do the math to figure out what tiny percentage of the global population that is, but that we are a so an, a, um, an, an extreme source of greenhouse gas emissions, in part because of our coal and gas history. We are a leading man, um, agricultural and manufacturing state. And so we have heavy industry and those are important to, to the Commonwealth. I mean, the the history of the Commonwealth is a history of industry, of hard labor. Pennsylvania built the United States. I mean, like we really are a kind of crucible for the creation and, and, and strength of, of the U.S. And so it's important that we acknowledge the past and the people who worked for us. And honor they, their contribution. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that we create um, a plan it says the, the costs that we have been paying and are really going to be paying are not worth it. And so we need to work with industries and incentivize industries that create, uh, I mean, I keep saying uh, um, a brighter future for, for all people. And I'll just note that on, on, on these kind of issues, my opponent, Carrie Benninghoff, has voted... Um, in the in the wrong direction, um, he he told me that he was not interested in advancing legislation that would help commercial businesses um, put more energy efficiency and renewable energy, you know, in their business, um, which I think is, you know, I think that that's ridiculous. Um, I would take that action almost immediately. You know, I'm I'm a huge proponent of of taking action and, and actually something that Brandy brought up earlier, this climate resolution in Ferguson Township, I, I was the, the author of that resolution, right? Um, and I would try to author more legislation like that 
um, for, for Pennsylvania. So Brandy, I, I want to add something I forgot to mention in that regard, because I was talking about individual action, um, mm -hmm. uh, systemic change. And one of the most important things, of course, we can do as individuals is elect politicians who will act on our behalf rather than on the behalf of the polluting interests. And that's why I'm uh, happy to be, uh, you know, helping your campaign in, in any way possible, because we need visionaries mm -hmm. like you uh, who are going to represent our interests. We can't solve these problems individually. Right. We can only solve them through policies and we need politicians who will support those policies. And so that's yeah. why I'm, I'm so happy that you're running for this position, my friend. Well, thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, that's great, that's great to hear. I do want to, I want to turn back to that resolution because the, what Mike, what we're talking about here is some version of collective action. And so what Ferguson Township is doing with, you know, or alongside other municipal governments is a form of collective action. So Brandy, I'm gonna ask you to, you know, you can't nerd out too much. That's okay. <laughs> but I, can. I, I, I know, can. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, we need to make sure that people are um, engaged, right? So, but I know that right. you have some slides prepared on what Ferguson Township has done. Because mm -hmm. I just think it's really important that people see that one, in local government, you can really get some work done. And two, you can make a difference on this issue that seems so gigantic that what would you ever be able to do about it? You've done it at a scale that can impact the lives of 19,000 people. Yeah. Okay. So I do have a couple of slides that I'm happy to share. Um, these were initially presented to the Board of Supervisors after we completed the inventory as part of a, a regular Ferguson Township public meeting. So this is sort of our big chocolate pie of emissions. <laughs> um, and what's really helpful about this is that it tells us which sectors to tackle, with, where we have the most opportunities to make gains and, and really make our overall pie smaller, right? That's, that's the goal of this. And so let's not worry about the numbers for right now because they're kind of abstract and, and that, that's not as important as the proportions of, of these pies. If you imagine this is mm -hmm. Thanksgiving dinner, which piece of pumpkin pie do you want? Um, so, I want the apple pie actually, but- uh, Oh, never... <laughs> that's good to know. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll keep the pumpkin. Um, so really what we discovered, and this, isn't a, this is not surprising, this is pretty typical of, of these sorts of inventories that we do looking at our emissions is that um, our biggest sectors are energy consumption and, and transportation emissions. And so therefore they represent our biggest opportunities for improvement. Now for our purposes, at the local scale, addressing transportation can be pretty tricky. So while that's a big piece of our pie, we're, we're currently focusing most of our attention on our energy consumption. And um, we really want to get our residents involved and our business owners involved because here is an opportunity to sort of diffuse any of the political hoopla around climate change mm. and bring people together on it. Because when you save, when you, when you save energy, you're saving money. And that's something that we can all agree is good, right? Nobody wants to spend more on their utility bill every month than they have to. Um, and so we feel like there's a real opportunity here to educate both the residents of our township and our business owners about opportunities available through, through state level funding mechanisms and just decisions they can make on their own to, to reduce their energy consumption. Um, and you know, the goal here is to tackle this sort of low hanging fruit first. This will not get us to the, to the goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. Certainly not, mm -hmm. but it's a good step in the right direction. And it's a, it's a first step for us to sort of be engaging with our community more broadly, letting them know that this is a priority of the township and that there are people working at the local level who care about this. And sometimes that's the, that's really the big first step is that if your neighbors realize that this is something you also care about and maybe they haven't thought about it before but now they do think about it 
you can start to build this this community of concern around these issues and that's really mm -hmm. that's really key um so the the other thing that i did for our for our township supervisors because you know we're talking about things we can't see and you know what is mm -hmm. a ton of carbon dioxide emissions does that matter what it's really difficult for people to conceptualize so I pulled some equivalency um, information from the mm. EPA just to give you an idea of what Ferguson's total emissions footprint looks like in other contexts you know so 40,000 cars driven for a year right that's the footprint of Ferguson and I think things like this can help us sort of wrap our heads around um, what it means. And then, of course, the other thing to do is to compare with what, what your peers and what, what entities at other scales look like. Mm. And you know, if you look at these numbers, the numbers themselves aren't important. It is important to recognize that, you know, yes, on a local level, we're talking about very small numbers compared to the, the state or, or the country, of course. But but these little numbers are all part of that aggregate, right? And these emissions are happening at a local scale, so we need to address them at a local scale. Right. No, that's that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, sure. your screen with us, Brandy. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. Um, yeah, because people people don't experience the global average temperature going up, right? And so that's one of the that's one of the things people are like, oh, you know, it, what? who cares if the temperature just goes up, you know, a, a degree Celsius or, or whatever, but it's, it, that's only the average. It's not showing you the swings and we experience the swings and those swings impact, obviously, I mean, we talked a little bit about the Australian wildfires, but here in central Pennsylvania, we talked about the record wet year. Penn, uh, Center County had 63.75 inches of rain um, that year, which was a humongous, humongous swing. And so we know that a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. And then when that falls, it impacts our infrastructure, right? And when it impacts our infrastructure, that means that it is harder for you and me to go about our daily lives. Pennsylvania has a D from the American Society for Civil Engineers on storm and wastewater infrastructure. We have many failing bridges, right? And when you get continued, you know, record rain, it stresses out already stressed systems even more. And so, you know, I, I think it's really important that when we see that at the local level, you can do some things, but the scale of the investment needs to come from, from higher up, I would say. And the legislature that we have right now has absolutely refused to do that. They have refused to do it. We do have a, a question here and I, that I wanna address from Bill. And um, I, I think I can answer it. What can you tell us about PASB 600? What are the chances that the targets for the PA renewable energy portfolio will be updated? Um, I would say that with the current leadership in the House and Senate, that it is unlikely to be updated because the natural gas industry pays them not to. Um, this is despite the fact that, so I work at Penn State University and I was part of the team that secured our solar power purchase agreement. That solar power purchase agreement beats the price of the grid such that we are projecting when I say we, the university, I only work there, I'm not speaking for the university. The university projects that it will save $14 million over the next 25 years. Um, that's a lot of money. And um, the natural gas industry doesn't want you to know that and are basically paying people who are elected to do everything they can to prevent it from happening more. Um, if I were there, I would advance immediately a change to the alternative energy portfolio standard at, to, to um, incentivize a, a strong solar market, for example. Um, it's, it's a great point. You know, uh, on average, uh, fossil fuels are still a little cheaper because of all the incentives that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, 
the governments uh, in power have provided the fossil fuel industry, but we're already seeing in some markets, renewable energy already outcompetes fossil fuel energy. And that will become more true over time. It just won't become true enough at a large enough scale on its own for us to solve this problem. That's why we need incentives on top of that. Right, right. And, uh, you know, so, so let's, let's maybe look at some of the solutions, right? Sometimes I don't like that word because it's not like a, you know, I'm not like solving like, a, you know, two plus two equals four. It's not quite that simple, but we'll talk about some solutions. So it can be an energy, agriculture, land use. You know, what, what do you think some of the things are that we ought to be doing in Pennsylvania to, to, to solve, solve the climate problem? Oh, Mike? Yeah. And I know Brandy, you know, uh, the, sort of pie chart she showed really speaks to that, right? I mean, the sweet spot, obviously, the low hanging fruit, um, which accounts for nearly two thirds of our local emissions is electricity and transportation, is power and transportation. And so, you know, for example, we, uh, our most recent uh, uh, purchase, uh, vehicle purchase was a, an electric um, uh, uh, vehicle, a, a uh, uh, it's a, um, uh, a plug-in uh, hybrid electric vehicle. And so we can plug it in um, and do at least all of the sort of local commuting on electricity. And our electricity comes from wind because we've chosen to pay a little bit extra and get our power uh, from a wind only uh, <laughs> plan, right? Yeah, a lot of us have done that because we know it's the right thing to do. It shouldn't cost more. That's why we need those market incentives. It shouldn't cost more to make decisions that are friendlier to the planet. But right now it does because we don't have policies in place that properly incentivize it. But right now, you know, we get our power from wind. We charge that vehicle off of um, our mm -hmm. electricity. And so we're, we're at least doing our local commuting off of wind-created electricity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's the sort of... Those are the sorts of changes we're going to need. Um, we need to uh, decarbonize the grid and electrify transportation. If we can do both of those things, then, you know, that, that two thirds of our carbon emissions, we can make a huge dent in it. As uh, Brandy said, it won't get us all the way to carbon neutrality you know, by mid-century alone. So we're going to need policies on, on top of that. But right now, there are things that we can do to incentivize this shift away from, you know, burning uh, carbon, from burning fossil fuels um, when it comes to transportation, when it comes to uh, Great. Um, our, uh, power generation. Yep. Great. Brandy? Well, you know, I think a lot of these changes do need to come from levels that are above what we can accomplish at, lo at the local scale, you mm. know, but by, but by chipping away at the things we can you know, making sensible decisions with, with zoning and codes and, and the way we manage our townships and our, our communities, the way we the, are planning, you know, like creating more, more walkable and bikeable communities. Um, those are small changes that we can make to chip away at things until we get the bigger institutional support that we need. Mm -hmm. And I also think that you know, what's interesting is that if you look at, at um, opinion, like survey data gathered from the American public, the issue of climate change is actually not nearly as polarizing as what we see from our, our elected officials, like mm. the talking heads at the national level, right? Mm. And so what this means is this is an opportunity, but, but the problem is that currently a lot of people are not climate voters. It's not their top choice. So even though 80% of Americans support increased investment in um, research and development for renewable energy technologies, that doesn't play out in who we're voting for in terms of who's going to support that. And so I think somehow getting us to be climate voters mm. is is a big part of the of the puzzle that will drive action at the federal level right no i i i i i agree and i mean i know we've looked at survey data you know that shows that people 
are, feel overwhelmingly positively about solar energy mm -hmm. and wind energy. They are the two most popular um, or most liked forms of energy production in the United States by far. Mm -hmm. Twice as popular as natural gas and almost three times as popular as coal. So it, it, it hovering around 90%. So people, people want it. They also really, people love to recreate in intact, healthy forests. I mean, I was in the Rothrock State Forest earlier today, you know, um, and during COVID-19, they like it even more. <laughs> and and um, those forests are actually doing a tremendous amount of work for us. And if we were thoughtful and, you know, did something like, you think about the economic fallout that's happened from COVID-19 and the kinds of very likely um, government created um, job programs. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had a Commonwealth civil, Commonwealth Climate and Conservation Corps where we could re reemploy people in reforesting more of our state. We have all the strip mine land and, and whatnot. You know, we could, we could do a lot of work and those trees will not only, you know, take carbon out of the atmosphere, they, they're beautiful. <laughs> they will one day be places where we can recreate. They could become timber um, and, and um, they clean our air and our water, you know? So trees are the answer is, you know, one of the, it's a little cliche, but I love it. You know, I like to say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, I think we have two distinct options. And that is to either be at the table or be on the menu, right? Mm. While climate change presents this huge and sometimes overwhelming challenge of, of mm. the fact that it sort of touches everything we care about, it also presents this opportunity to sort of think into the future about what we want our lives and the places we live to look like and then work toward getting there. You know, because the, the good news, I think, is that a lot of the solutions to the challenges we experience with climate change are things that bring along a lot of co-benefits. You know, these are, these are things we should want to do anyway, right? Making more walkable cities, having more trees and more habitat for, you know, a, a mm -hmm. biodiverse world and, and all sorts of things. So I think that you know, it's really important to recognize that while climate change might not be everybody's top issue, it probably touches something that is their top issue. And so I think that if we just work at chipping away at how making changes to make the places we live better communities, mm. can, what that looks like, the climate change benefits come along for the ride. And it turns out the atmosphere doesn't actually care why you've reduced emissions, just that you've reduced them. <laughs> Yeah. M Mike, yeah. it looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah. I mean, as, as I like to say, uh, you know, there is no economy on a dead planet. Um, and we have to get past this fallacy that there's some, this, this false uh, dichotomy that somehow we have to make a choice between the health of our economy and the health of our environment. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have a healthy economy without a thriving planetary environment. And as, um, you know, as Brandy pointed out, there are all these co-benefits. Um, you know, when we reduce our carbon emissions, when we move to clean energy, uh, we're, you know, we've got a cleaner environment, we have healthier forests, we have, um, you know, thriving ecosystems, we create a better world. Why wouldn't we want to do that? And so we have to recognize that, um, and, and part of it is, you know, uh, when you ask somebody, you know, how, how much they prioritize climate, maybe it won't be in their top few um, the items on their list, but it turns out that everything on their list, it turns, you know, it is going to be greatly impacted by climate. Um, climate right. is impacting uh, human health. It's impacting our, uh, you know, national security, you know, matters of national security. Uh, our national security community has very clearly told us this is the greatest threat we face um, ultimately uh, in, in the years ahead uh, because of the increased competition for resources as we get you know, as, as we have less uh, drinkable water, less food, less land, and a growing global population, um, that's a recipe 
for uh, for conflict. Uh, yeah. And you can go on down the list. Uh, everything you care about, it turns out, is going to be impacted adversely by climate change if we do don't do something uh, to, to, to sort of change the course. Right. Yeah. The, the, uh, the United States military on the, in the quadrennial defense review called it the threat multiplier, right. And an accelerant of risk. So all those things that you worry about, it makes, it makes them all worse. And, and in fact, I think one of the things that is quite interesting about COVID-19 and we have some questions about, the relationship between, you know, like, let's talk about COVID-19 and, and climate change. Um, are, you know, do you see, are, are there any silver linings in, in, this, in this crisis? Well, you know, I, I think uh, that um, there, uh, I'm not sure I would call it silver linings. Uh, I think it's a tragedy and we have to recognize that. And there are people we know uh, just this past week, uh, we lost two giants in the, in the world of environmental mm -hmm. science. We lost John uh, Houghton, who was the uh, original chair of the IPCC back in its early days. Um, Sir John, he was uh, knighted uh, for his contributions in the mm. UK to an understanding of, of climate change. Um, and we lost Donald Kennedy, who was uh, former president of, of uh, Stanford University. He was the editor of, uh, of Science Magazine, and he was a leading environmental scientist at Stanford. Mm. Um, and both of them, within the last week, uh, died of COVID-19. And so there is a very real toll that we are seeing. Um, and, and in part, it's because we didn't take the actions that the scientific community was telling this administration to take. And so we've seen US uh, coronavirus cases and deaths skyrocket beyond the trajectory we've seen for any other industrial country. And it's because our government, our, our federal government, um, the executive branch, our president, was not listening to what scientists were saying. And so I think this lays bare the cost of anti-science mm. and in a very visceral way, because we can actually see the deaths that are occurring because of the unwillingness of the current president to listen to what scientists are saying. And obviously that has uh, deep implications for an even greater long-term crisis that we face if we don't act, and that's the climate mm. crisis. And there are just mm. so many lessons. Climate change is actually the greatest long-term public health threat we face. And so COVID-19 right. is an acute public health threat that uh, understandably is um, occupying our, our uh, you know, uh, our, 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 is, is, you know, a focus of our attention right now, but, but an even greater long-term public health threat if we don't act is climate change. Right. Randy? So the one thing that I have noticed is that, you know, when we talk about climate change, we very often talk about, you know, the, the cost and efficiency differences of responding reactively versus proactively. And as, as Mike pointed out, that's, that's playing out in spades. We're seeing the consequences of relying on mm. a more reactive approach in, in COVID-19. But the other thing, and this might be something positive that lives beyond the, the, the really acute problem of COVID-19 right now, is that there's a lot of talk about resiliency and vulnerability around, mm -hmm. around the virus, right? I mean, that's all we're focused on. Who is most vulnerable? Why are they more susceptible? What, what makes that? How can we increase their adaptive capacity? All of these things trying to understand that. And now, you know, as, times go, as time is going on, we're looking at the, the economic fallout and who is most vulnerable to that. And, you know, what I hope is that, is that that terminology now, when we talk about it in the context of climate change, might resonate with people more mm. in, in terms of understanding that the impacts of climate change will be experienced very differently across place and, you know, socioeconomic status and, and all sorts of other factors. And so understanding those vulnerabilities and how we can reduce them ahead of time, I think is part of our response because again, you know, we can do, we can do a lot to try to reduce the causes of climate change, but even if we turn it all off today, we're already experiencing impacts. So we need to plan for that as well. So mm -hmm. that's what I hope comes out of this is a mm. better understanding and appreciation for the 
complexity of vulnerability and the importance of building resiliency planning into our thinking. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's, there are, we, we have a number of, of, of questions. Um, and I want people to know that if we don't get to your question, um, my campaign and I will do our best to, to uh, answer your question. Okay. Um, we don't want anybody to, to feel left out. We do have uh, a few questions here actually about, about fracking. Uh, in Pennsylvania, and what is being it, what's being proposed to limit it, or um, uh, you know what is being done done about it? And you know, I'm not sure how how up to date either of you are on on this, but I'll give the floor to either of you if you'd like. I'm happy to offer some thoughts, and I'm sure Brandy has some thoughts too. Um, you know, people often ask me about uh, natural gas. Can this be the bridge to a fossil fuel, you know, free future? And, and the idea, uh, there's this um, notion that natural gas is sort of a carbon-friendlier uh, fossil fuel. Uh, and nominally speaking, um, when you burn natural gas, you produce about half as much uh, carbon dioxide for the amount of power, electricity that you generate as if you burn coal. So it has sort of half the CO2 footprint of coal. But here's the problem. Uh, the process of fracking, as you alluded to, hydraulic fracturing, um, extracting uh, natural gas, which is uh, largely methane um, from the ground involves a, a process, uh, hydraulic fracturing, that uh, leads to fissures, cracks um, in, in the crust, in the surface of the earth. Some of that uh, methane just escapes into the atmosphere. You can't capture all of the methane that is released when you engage in hydraulic fracturing. So you capture some of it, and that's the natural gas, um, mostly methane, uh, but a lot of that methane is escaping into the atmosphere. And methane, at least on the time scale of the next couple decades. It doesn't sit in the atmosphere for as long as carbon dioxide. It's a shorter term, uh, a shorter lived gas, uh, as we say. But over time scales of a couple decades, which are extremely relevant to uh, meeting uh, some of the, um, you know, the, 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 the near term uh, limits that we've been talking about, keeping warming below two degrees or ideally one and a half degrees Celsius. Um, um, that is going to depend on the decisions that we make over the next decade and or decade right. and a half. And on that time scale, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. So it leads to additional warming. And some of the calculations that have been done now show that, first of all, we see a spike in methane. We see methane now on the increase after it had leveled off. And the isotopic signature of the methane tells us we actually know where it's coming from. Um, and I'm, I'm geeking out a little bit here. Right, right. Um, but we can actually tell where is the methane coming? Is this natural uh, releases of methane? Um, or is it coming from the burning of fossil fuels? Or is it coming from you know, a fossil fuel source, uh, the um, hydraulic fracturing, the fracking? And the isotopes tell us that it's, it's, it's from um, natural right. gas extraction. And so yeah. we're seeing this spike um, in methane. It's from natural gas extraction. And the estimates are that it's responsible for maybe as much as 25% now of the warming over the last decade or two. That's a sizable yeah. amount of the warming. And yeah. that makes a difference. If we're trying to avert warming the planet, hey, we're already above one degree Celsius. We're trying to limit it below one and a half. That doesn't give us a whole lot of wiggle room. And so methane is not a, a, a bridge, you know, natural gas is not a bridge to a fossil fuel uh, free future. To me, it's, it's a bridge nowhere. And mm. the real threat is that it actually crowds out investment in the true solution to this problem, which is renewable energy. Right. So, so there are, there are a, a couple of things here to note. The, in Pennsylvania, um, the governor has, you know, proposed, re, you know, increased regulation on methane. He has numerous times proposed a severance tax um, and has been kicked back um, and pushed back by the Republican legislature with war chests of money from the natural gas industry who actually pay severance taxes in other states, including West Virginia and Texas, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, the, the kind of bad faith action by that industry in particular, I think really needs to be named 
Um, and, and I'll note that they are major contributors to my opponent's campaigns. Um, and that should tell you something about that relationship, despite the fact that we don't have fracking in the 171st legislative district. Um, you know, so the, but there need to be limits uh, and there need to be, uh, there needs to be a level playing field. If we had a better, to go back to something someone asked about before, a better alternative energy portfolio standard, we could very quickly level that playing field in, in a very significant way. Now, someone has said, what actions do you recommend for the average person to take to counteract climate change? Go to papowerswitch.org and start buying renewable energy. That is something that you can do right now to send your own market signal, right. pool it with other people, and change our power sector. That is something that everyone can do, and you can do it in a in a cost competitive way at, at, at this point. So you know, shop around there. Um, so we we have. Uh, I want to I want to get a couple of other other questions in here as well. Um, someone wanted to know what climate change impacts are likely to be in Center County in 20 or so years. What, what kinds of things are gonna be different from today or yesterday? I feel like I, I've been monopolizing some of the time here. I'd like no, to- No, no, you should definitely answer this yeah. one first. <laughs> I'm happy to just throw out one example. I mean, the example I like to use is think about the worst heat wave you've ever endured. And, and, and since you know the time that we've been in um, Center County now for uh, 15 years, uh, we've seen some 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 you know, really uh, you know uh, unprecedented uh, heat waves here uh, in in Central Pennsylvania uh, over the years. So think about the very worst heat wave um, that we've uh, experienced, where temperatures are you know in the you know the mid 90s uh, for days on end, um, uh, and often very humid, uh, high uh, sort of uh, heat um, indice values with the heat and the humidity here in central Pennsylvania. Okay, in you know by 2040, 2050, if we continue on the course that we're on, if we don't act to change course, business as usual, burning of fossil fuels. Um, and we increase CO2 concentrations to, you know, above 450, above 500 uh, parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, pre-industrial levels, 280. Right now we're about 410. Um, if we continue sort of on the historical trajectory, we'll be well beyond 450 towards 500 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the middle of the century, again, think of that worst heat wave you've ever endured, we will call that summer. That will be the term that we use because we will have 60 to 70 to 80 days a year that are like that. Um, and that's just one attribute. Wow. Wow. Well, that sounds like good news. <laughs> well, that's, that's one possible future, but it's a future that we can avoid if we take and, action. That's and, yeah. It, yeah, and I, I, Brandy, I wanna give you the, the, the chance to add anything if, if you'd like. Um, well, I, I was going to focus, uh, s since Mike talked about temperature precipitation, you know, probably what we're going to be seeing are, are more summers like that summer we had a couple of years ago where we're getting a lot of extreme precipitation. We're getting more of it. This will be per particularly problematic for the southeastern part of the state, which is heavily reliant on agriculture as, as its industry. Um, Having this more erratic pattern of precipitation falling is, makes it very difficult to plan um, for agriculture. It's it's it really stresses our infrastructure. There's going to be a lot of you know per, uh, damage to personal property and homes. So I think that 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 is a big problem, and it's it's go, it's going to have impacts on some of the industries that we care about. You know, by mid-century, you know. Nobody's going to be able to go hop on the bunny slope at, at Tussie Mountain to see, if, like, if, if we, we don't do anything, right? right? If we have this this business as usual, yeah. So, and it's it's hard because it's difficult to imagine that sort of scenario that far away. But I think that you know, by by looking at 
some of the extremes we're already seeing, uh, you know, each year with these things that helps, that helps bring it home a bit more right. that, right. that the changes will be here. I mean, by mid century, it's going to be like, like Alabama here in the summer. Right. So, right. so, so I want to, uh, we have a question here from, uh, from a, a Mifflin or not Mifflin from a Milheim uh, borough council member um, about how solar can tie in with agricultural industry. And so I'm going to, I want to respond to this question. So if we, if there were a policy change that made it easier to build solar in Pennsylvania, the solar industry could uh, work with farmers who like dairy farmers right now who are subject to the incredible price volatility of dairy and they could have like so if you have a 150 or 200 acre farm and you can work with a solar developer to secure say half of that and you know generate um clean climate friendly cheap electricity for 25 to 50 years right and then the farmer actually has steady secure income over that entire time can have their soil regenerate during that time and they can provide habitat for the, you know, like honeybees, which are under threat for um, related, but not the same reasons. And so there, I think, are really great opportunities for, for the agricultural and energy industries to really work together in a way that secures all of us in lots and lots of ways. I've called this um, a, a ripple of benefits, right? Um, and so I think, you know, that, that's, that's very exciting to me um, and, and, it can, and it can work and it can generate revenue for local taxes and, and whatnot. So um, we have another question that says, what energy bill would I put forward first? I mean, I would go after something that, that would just amplify what already exists and I would work on the alternative energy portfolio standard right away. After that, I would wanna do something that would um, work with individual residents um, so that they can more easily adopt rooftop solar, high efficiency heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. Um, it would be called, it's called R PACE legislation, residential property assessed clean energy legislation. That, um, but my opponent doesn't want to do that, right? Um, and when I talked to him about it, actually, you know what he said? He said, well, would uh, would you be able to get a more efficient natural gas boiler? And I thought, wow, like, and 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 let me just say, Carrie Benninghoff and I can have a totally civil conversation. He and I can talk. He is a respectful man. He has served the community, but I think his time is well passed. And on this issue, makes it incredibly clear, incredibly clear, where he is out of touch. Now we're coming up right to the hour here. So, and I've just, you know, <laughs> stated pretty strong opinion in, in the kinds of courses of action that, that I would take. Um, so, you know, Brandy and Mike, I, I really wanna thank you both for, for being here because one of the things that we've done, and this goes back to Scott, Scott's question about what actions do you recommend for the average person to take to counteract climate change? Talk about it. And talk vote on it. it. Vote on this issue. Vote, and vote, vote. Yes. Vote, vote <laughs> and talk about the issue and vote on the issue. Now, I think it's very clear to you at home how, um, where I stand on the issue that I will take action and that I already have taken action on the issue. So the proof is in the pudding. You should also know that across my campaign and once I win office, that expertise and science matter to this campaign into my future office. And I will always work with people who do the kind of on the ground work that Brandy's doing to you know, work with her community and that Mike does looking at the great big picture. Cause that's how we can work best when we have the best information possible. Now, if you like what you've heard tonight, I would encourage you to go see some of the other things that we've done. You can follow me on Twitter, and at Facebook and on Instagram at Buck4PA. You can find 
the campaign online at buckforpa.com. You can learn more about me, learn about my platform. And yes, you can also donate to my campaign, which is really, really important. My opponent has a war chest of natural gas money. I do not, and I never will. I want to keep this campaign clean and working for people and a smart climate future. So thank both of you for being here. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And thank everyone. Thank you for being here. And um, I will see you in a couple of weeks when we will be talking about mental health in Pennsylvania. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye, folks. Thanks. Thank you.